um, I'm going to just share a couple of quick uh, photos here. This is um, this is what I do with One Fish Foundation. Why is it not? Oh, there we go. So sustainable seafood education, bringing the message into classrooms and communities, um, getting students of a whole range of ages from um, middle school up into college, thinking about where seafood comes from, thinking about uh, seafood as a resource, thinking about our connections to seafood. This is a theme that we've already talked about today. So we do it um, in a variety of ways. Uh, more often than not, at least in non-COVID times, we do it directly in classrooms um, where we're, uh, we're able to get hands-on gear, uh, talk about different gear types, or like down here on the lower left-hand corner, this is the uh, Shoals Marine Lab off the Isles of Shoals, and this was a, a, a freshman and a sophomores from University of New Hampshire, Carleton College, Cornell University, um, where we were talking about uh, the intersection of uh, seafood as a resource, policy, climate change, um, and had good connections there. And in fact, um, you might see Jen actually in this photo. Uh, this is how we first met. This was a few years ago. And then in COVID times, we did this, uh, we did things virtually, and this is Melanie Brown. You'll be hearing from her uh, on Friday in the Indigenous, Indigenous Access Deep Dive. She's up in Juneau, Alaska. I learned to fish, uh, set net fish for a sockeye salmon with her. She joined one of my classes uh, that I was teaching with students, ninth grade students here in Maine. So um, we also do this with sustainable seafood dinners at different restaurants, getting people to meet the fishermen. This is Tim Ryder down here. Uh, who caught the fish that they're eating and drawing those connections. So I'm going to stop right there. I've gone over my time a little bit, but that's just sort of the idea. If anybody wants to talk about that, maybe sort of uh, figure out a way to collaborate and do this uh, elsewhere, please um, check out. We've got an expo booth for One Fish Foundation. All right, that's me. Perfect. Um, I don't have my presentation pulled up. Uh, was not necessarily prepared to speak today, uh, but the opportunity came up in the last breakout sessions and figured, why not while I'm here? I'm really excited to be here and I want to just say like, thank you for uh, like opening your arms for this community and welcoming me into it. Uh, this is my first slow food, slow fish event ever. I'm coming from a background is in hunter recruitment, retention and reactivation. I'm based in Raleigh, North Carolina right now, and I just finished up my master's. Uh, and as I'm searching for the next steps in my career and jobs that I wanna go into after this, I'm really all about the local food movements and um, connecting young people with where their food is coming from, because I think that's the way to build like the next generation of sustainable living. Uh, so again, just thank you for having me. If you'd like to connect about um, connecting hunting and fishing outside of this sphere. I'll write my email in the chat. Um, but yeah, outside of that, I'm also really passionate about environmental filmmaking. So I'm working on a couple pretty uh, film ventures right now. Um, and my focus is kind of intersectional environmentalism. So I don't think we can talk about uh, environmental justice without also recognizing racial justice and, and health justice and things like that. So if you'd also like to talk um, environment, things of that nature, feel free to shoot me an email as well. But just really happy to be here and wanted to introduce myself uh, formally to the whole group as like kind of the, the lone non-fisher or non-fish person, uh, what it feels like in this group. I'm coming from a hunting background, but I'm really excited to be here and kind of connect these realms. So thanks for having me. I'm Lance Nacio, I own and operate of Anne-Marie Seafood. Uh, I'm not going to talk much. I got some guys doing some work in the background. That's the noise we hear. So uh, I got uh, 
I'm a small family fishing operation. I have three boats. One's a 65 foot plate, uh, plate freezer shrimp boat. The other is a 60 foot offshore reef fish boat. And another is a 40 foot inshore shrimping boat. And uh, we have a unique operation. We unload our own boats. So uh, I have family. My son runs my shrimp boat. My nephew runs my fish boat. Uh, so we kind of have it uh, in, all in the family, and we do uh, eight farmers markets. We have 12 farmers markets now, but uh, we also have a small processing room where we uh, unload our products and do some value-added things with our products, uh, and you know bring them to market. Uh, we have a, a big storage freezer where we hold our product here on in-house, and uh, you know we uh, we just sell whatever we can sell that we produce ourselves, and uh, you know, it makes it to where everyone can uh, make a decent living being a fisherman. Uh, the price of fuel is steadily going up uh, today, and we need to, you know, just make sure that uh, we stay a step ahead, uh, you know, with sales and, and value-added products to where we could sustain in the fisheries. Because uh, a few years ago, we had our price of uh, fuel that went up to $4 a gallon, and that was some of the most of our challenging times is, uh, you know, when the cost of operation uh, exceeds the, the profits that you're, a, you're able to make. So, uh, you know, it's just, it's difficult being a fisherman, but you have to be able to adapt and, uh, you know, change uh, as time changes to keep up. Uh, but for now, it's all I'm going to say. It's just noise is driving me nuts. Thanks, Lance. <laughs> as always, things are humming at Lance Maggio's ranch. So, <laughs> um, but yeah, you know, it, it, it's great. Um, by the way, I will just mention to everyone, the quality of Lance's product is incredible. I've got about 10 pounds of shrimp still in my freezer, and I'll be making gumbo probably at the end of this event on March 27th just to sort of celebrate. But anyway, uh, thanks, Lance. Uh, next up, Amanda Swinomer. Hey, Amanda, how are you? Good hey. to see you again. Yeah, it's nice to uh, see you too. Please go ahead and, and share your story. Um, well, I've been a wild seaweed harvester on Vancouver Island in BC, Canada for 20 years. And um, recently, in 2019, there's a new company that started up here. Um, and they want to establish the largest seaweed farming industry in North America in the waters off Vancouver Island where I wild harvest. And um, they're moving fairly quickly and uh, they want to develop 500 hectares uh, within three years um, and then a thousand hectares within five years. And this industry essentially has never existed here and there's uh, very little regulation. Um, there's no regulation on size or distance apart from farms. There hasn't been any research done on the impact of this scale of seaweed farming on wild seaweed, on fisheries, on the ecosystem at large. So uh, I've been talking with the Slow Fish Network um, a lot in BC, Paola and um, International Slow Fish. And we've really been co coalescing together to sort of try and come up with um, uh, some shared concerns among small scale seaweed producers internationally and what uh, kind of regulations we want to take forward to our um, policymakers and regulators. So I just wanted to share that sort of as a wild seaweed harvester here for 20 years, I'm very concerned about uh, the scale that they're proposing in an area where we have the greatest cold water diversity of seaweeds on the planet and thriving, healthy, wild kelp forests, um, well established here. So yeah, I just wanted to share that sort of something that, um, that we've been talking about here and concerned about here. Um, they're proposing that it's a very healthy food, but they're the scale they're proposing, they'd probably be selling it as animal feed or even for the biofuel industry. Um, so, or potentially selling uh, carbon offsets to large corporations. So 
anyways, I just wanted to share that and see if the community has anything to, to any thoughts to, um, that they'd like to share around that. Thanks a lot, Amanda. Greatly appreciate it. And you know, you're, you're, you're bringing up, you know, again, stuff that's talking about our shared values and we're talking about scale here. Um, this is something we're definitely going to dive into uh, next week when we talk about both aquaculture and the blue economy, where you've got a huge player like this that is essentially privatizing a huge section of the ocean. It'll have ecological impacts, it'll have socioeconomic impacts, and, you know, and, and so this is when we talk about the values that we're trying to uplift the community based harvesters like you. Um, and where these things come in, you know, it's important to have to bring these issues up and to find out, you know, uh, alliances within the network and figure out collaboratively ways to speak out against this to, to you know, to oppose it. So yeah, thank you. I will be, I'll be speaking at the aquaculture deep dive yes. as well. Yeah, uh, so you, you definitely want to, to join that conversation because this will be, a, you know, a very important conversation as aquaculture is a, is a big story now. Uh, and scale is everything in terms of where the values lie. So thanks again, Amanda. Um, so next up, uh, who do we have? Iris, there you are. <laughs> Hello. Love the headlamp. <laughs> Hi. <laughs> I'm also at my commercial sewing machine. Um, my name is Iris Nash, and my husband and I are commercial power trollers. We started direct marketing our fish just last year under the name Nash Family Fish. Um, my husband's been commercial fishing for over a decade. He, this is his ninth year as a captain. I started fishing a nine years ago and uh, we have two small children, three and five years old, two boys who fish with us increasingly more so as they get older. Um, commercial power trolling is a hook and line fishery. So we primarily target coho and king salmon. Um, we've also been doing lingcod and rockfish and it is all, um, our goal is that we stop selling to larger processors and that we market our own fish completely um, long-term goal, uh, being able to have more of a, a scope and awareness on how we can positively impact and be more stewards of this resource. And um, we uh, also recently, this year, we have our boat in the yard right now. We are upgrading our, we removed our old engine and we replaced it with a more fuel efficient engine. And we are adding sail to our sailboat. Um, it has always been a sailboat, but it's also been a commercial fishing vessel first. So we are really committed to um, longer term, you know, the seven generations out is definitely a strong awareness of ours and how that we can help our operation to be viable. And a lot of the questions I'm having right now is how to be in reciprocity to the tribes and the people of this land, the Klingon Ani, and, and being where we are. Um, this is where we're at. So I'm, all, I'm just really grateful to be a part of these conversations and thankful for the opportunity to share. Thank you, Iris. Uh, it's great to hear your story and the work that you and your husband are doing. Um, mm -hmm. And I think it's, it's awesome that you are considering these things, you know, in terms of the relationship with the indigenous communities there. Um, and, and so exploring that is really important as we we're going to talk about on Saturday and that deep dive around indigenous access to food systems is broadening awareness. Um, and, and that means, you know, creating these kinds of, uh, connections so that mm -hmm. there's, there's, you know, a two way conversation. This is something that Denise had mentioned. So again, thank you very much for, for sharing your story. And you know we'll you know, we'll continue these conversations going forward. Um, so next up, uh, I believe is Gary. Uh, Here, you, uh, you uh, ready to rock and roll? Are you? Yeah, um, just something awesome. Kevin and I've been kicking around and and hope to have conversations throughout the next two weeks with everybody. Is the on-site processing like what Lance is talking about? 
And this has been an idea that lots of has been kicking around because uh, d down in the Gulf, there's so many fish that we don't use. That's, just, that's America. Uh, you go to Italy, but targa is a big thing. We hardly fish mullet in the Gulf. Well, we fish mullet, and it goes into animal and aquaculture feed. Uh, same thing goes for anchovies and sardines. When you go to Italy, you're, you're eating those fried in a cone. We haven't developed the palate for it. So um, Kevin and I have been kicking around this, this idea of, of working off of the model of the uh, remote container uh, processing for salmon to start having these type of contain developed containers that can give uh, fishers, you know, more control uh, like what Lance has so they can process on site. And especially in the Gulf where the coastline is redefined week to week, these things need to be portable. So uh, in the container. So as we venture through the next couple of weeks, anybody that's got ideas for processing, portable on-site processing, pull Kevin and, I, and me aside because we're we really want to in the next year develop a fundable proposal that can be duplicated, not scaled, duplicated in other places and help small fishers. I'm done. All right, thanks, Gary. And then, you know, that's a great, great idea. And it's a really important point, you know, facilities, infrastructure, that's a huge thing for, for fishermen to consider. Um, the cost, the expense, the space, and, you know, uh, even um, the, uh, uh, waterfront, working waterfronts are, are, are a constant issue when you've got development coming in. So these are important points uh, to consider, and they will come up in further deep dive discussions, uh, particularly around the blue economy and the blue commons. So, yeah, you know, look up Gary and Kevin to, to, to think about that, because that's a great collective brainstorming idea that would be great to move forward. If we could make that so that it's accessible to small scale independent um, community fish harvesters, that'd be awesome. Thank you, everyone. You know, these are these are great ways, uh, touch points to, for the community. Um, we will do this again and we will, you know, prompt people to continue sharing. Um, for those, you know, who have spoken today, um, you know, keep keep telling your story and, you know, um, look for ways to connect. Um, and, uh, you know, this is this is what it's about. It's just sort of drawing these connections. Hey, Sarah. Hey, Collis. Hey, everyone. Is it my turn? Yeah, it's your turn. Go okay. for it. I just jumped into all of this, so I have no idea who I'm speaking to other than Collis, but um, hello to everyone out there, and thank you for giving me this uh, few minutes to say something. Um, so I, I'm just, uh, I'm a fisherman in Rhode Island. I'm a deckhand on a gillnet boat, um, and in my spare time, I do some social science research and um, freelance fishing, fishery community organizing. Um, and those of you who are based in the U.S. may know that there's been a flurry of sort of climate change action at the federal level in the last couple of months. And one of those things is that uh, NOAA, our National Fisheries um, Management Agency, has launched a 30-day public input period to solicit ideas from stakeholders on what would constitute climate resilient fisheries. Um, and uh, so this public comment period ends uh, April 2nd. And I would like to offer my services to um, all fishermen across the United States, whether you're a captain, deckhand, whether you know me personally or you've never heard of me before. Um, I would like to be your secretary if it helps alleviate the burden for, and makes it possible for you to submit your great ideas to NOAA about climate resilient fisheries. So I will put my name in the, um, in the chat. Um, or I'll put actually I put a link to uh, a Google Doc that has information about what I'm this this thing that I'm calling a fisherman's input drive for climate resilient fisheries. And please feel free at any time in the next two weeks to just reach out to me, any day, any time, and use me as your conduit to um, to send your brilliant ideas to NOAA on how to make our uh, nation's fisheries more climate resilient. Thank you. Thanks, Sarah. And that's that's a huge thing. You know, it, it, it's something that we all have to be thinking about. And so uh, I really appreciate the fact that you're you're working on that. I I'm, I'm, would suggest, and we can talk about this offline. We have these expo booths, and it would be great to set up an expo booth where you have this information, and you could even like you know do it, set it up in such a way that so that you could meet people there to talk about it 
uh, at some point. So we can we can talk about that offline, but I think that would be a great place for information about that because it really is important. We aren't going to fix climate change, period. We're going to have to adapt to it. And the fact that really opening up um, conversation about that is at least a step. So if we can, you know, if we can figure out how to to work around that that framework and have meaningful input, because fishermen are really sometimes out at the forefront of, you know, seeing where changes are happening before even scientists do. That's important. We need to be having those conversations. So thank you, Sarah. Appreciate it.